Good morning to all of those who are joining us for our message this morning from the Smith's Cove Baptist Church this Sunday, May 29th. Scripture reading comes from Luke's, Luke's Gospel. Actually, it's two parables joined together. I'm starting chapter 12, and I'm starting at verse 12. Someone said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbitrator between you? Then he said to them, Watch out and be on guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, What shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. Then Jesus said to the disciples, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or about your body or what you will wear. For life is more than food in the body, more than clothes. Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable Valuable are you than birds? Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to your life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? Consider how the wild flowers grow. They do not labor or spin, but I tell you, not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the fields, which is here today and thrown tomorrow into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? And do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it, for the pagan world runs after all such things, and your father knows that you need them. But first seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. So do not be afraid, little flock, as your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out. A treasure in heaven that will never fail where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, for your life that comes through your word, through your spirit. And we pray, Lord, this morning you write your word Upon our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It is said in the world that in order to make money, you need to have money. You use it. You invest it to make more money. Now, some people receive their inheritance from others and become wealthy. A few others may win lotteries if they're into gambling that make them rich. But most others become rich by working and at times allowing themselves to be so consumed by their unquenchable thirst for more. Many of us have had to work hard to have what we have today, and still others of us have worked just as hard, but may find that we have less. But as people, as individuals, what's the difference between someone with loads of money and someone with just enough to get by? The message today is not meant to be scolding people with money. I remember a story that my dad shared with me about one of his neighbors, a, a man that I knew. This neighbor would visit dad's house at least once a day. Now dad had a Bible sitting at the end of the kitchen table where he sat and he studied the word of God every day. Now the neighbor wasn't a Christian and dad and him would sometimes have some sharp debates over matters of the Bible and faith in Jesus Christ. The neighbor was the one that usually brought up matters about God and the Bible because the Bible was right there on the table. And I think he liked to go dead a little bit. The man had retired. He was a bit younger than my father, but he seemed to have it all. He had worked hard, he had invested well, but still the man didn't seem to be very happy. 
One day, Dad asked him a question. He said, and I'm going to call this man Percy. He said, Percy, name me something that you have that I don't have, something that I really need to have. Dad didn't give Percy a chance to answer. He says, Percy, you've got a car. I've got one. You've got a truck. I've got one, too. You've got a house. I have one. You have water and food and clothing, as do I. So, Percy, name me one thing. Other than your wife, what do you have that I don't have that I need? And I don't need your wife. Percy had a new car. I think at the time it might have been a Cadillac. A new truck, a home five times the size of Dad's and money in the bank. And he said to my dad, Avery, I envy you. All of this man's possessions, all of them new, all of his investments and security that he had acquired left him no better off than his neighbor who had used vehicles, a small old home, and not much extra of anything. He envied Dad because Dad was content with what he had. Dad wasn't concerned about having a new everything all of the time. So you might think the intro to this message today, that the message is about wealth and how, to, how we use it. Well, you might be partially right. Other than mentioning the word tithing right now, it's not going to be about tithing. So you can relax. Our scriptures tell us today that God considered this rich man a fool. Because he'd worked so hard for himself so that he could take life easy. But after he was ready to take life easy, God said in verse 20, you fool this very night, your life will be demanded from you. Who will get what you have prepared for yourself. I don't know about you, but in my life, as I've read through these parables, especially this one, we tend to run through this parable rather quickly, and there's a few reasons. First, we may not have loads of money, but we all tend to worry, and we tend to want to keep what we have for as long as we can. Or even if we're well off enough to share our wealth willingly, this parable has a sting in it for most people. Because each and every one of us, it's human nature to want to have that little nest egg, to be able to rely on and to look after ourselves into retirement. Scripture is not saying that there's anything wrong with that. But our conscience, well. Secondly, we also read where God calls this man a fool because of his actions. And we certainly want to rush through this parable because we don't want to read into it that any deeper that, you know, we as Christians wouldn't want to be considered a fool in the eyes of God. There's another reason why we speed through this parable, and that deals with the unknown times of our deaths. We don't know the time that God is going to call, and our life here will be demanded from us. It's something that we don't usually want to think about. There's some important points in all of these words. Our life, our individual existence here on earth, it is a gift. It's on loan to us. It's been given to us from the giver of life, our creator, God the Father. And at his time in choosing, the life comes back to him. So this message is not so much about what we are doing with our riches. It could be. But just as important, the message is about the fact that we are not our own. What we have, what we prize, what we work so hard to accumulate and protect, our very life and breath are not ours, but just on loan from God. So the question is, are we using wisely all that God has given us? Or are we storing it up for a rainy day? Are we treating what the Lord has loaned us as ours and not his? If we're to be honest with ourselves, all of us are like this rich man in the parable today. We may not have all the things that everyone else has, but think about the blessings that God has given us. Life has created us. From the foundations of the earth, God knew when you or I was going to be born. He has given us salvation. This was a plan from day one. We have found salvation through Jesus Christ. And then there's eternal life to come. In the here and now, we have homes, food, clothing. We live in the best nation, many of us would argue and agree. 
It doesn't sound right. Many of us would agree. The most peaceful, peaceful place in the land. We have freedoms that others die for. We have all of these things and much more, and yet we feel that we need not to have only more, but we forget that all that we have, it's all on loan. And we will not always have what we have today. Are we, start, are we ready to start living in eternity? Are all of our investments and our worth, will they remain here on earth for someone else to consume after we're gone? Or have we laid up treasure in heaven where it will exist forever? Jesus tells us in the scripture readings today in verse 33 and 4, he says, sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that won't wear out. These are not earthly purses. A treasure in heaven that cannot be exhausted. It's out of reach of thieves. And no moth is going to destroy it. It will not ro uh, rot. It won't corrode. And Jesus says, For wherever your treasure is, that's where you're going to find your heart. Where are we currently putting our investments, our treasures? And just what do our investments consist of? Where our treasures are, we will find our heart. It's a sticky question. I know. But what is it or who is it that we are living for? Where is our hearts? I know I've mentioned this in a sermon many years ago. I remember a TV pastor. He gave this example about salvation. Many Christians and their their lives are like a person who goes into a restaurant where there's a large buffet and a chef is uh, places on your plate what you know you choose from this long line of available goodies so we have a soul coming up to god steam line so to speak these choices from god and sadly many christians look at the entire menu and decide upon a life or a dish that something sounds like this like i'll take that salvation platter i want that and puts lots of mercy and grace all over my salvation see where i'm going with this and then the, the Lord or the chef will ask if we would like any service or soul willing, a soul winning or daily Bible reading and prayer on the side. Oh, no. Oh, no, that's not good for my way of life. A little too busy, but I'll I'll take a heaping of forgiveness for me. The Lord or chef might ask if we would like a dessert. You know, the little extras like visitation shut-ins or acts of kindness towards those who we may have differences with oh no can you imagine what that would do to the way i look in front of everybody what will people think of me too often we're always wrapped up in everything else that concerns us what will benefit us maybe sometimes others but being wrapped up in things that have no heavenly worth what good is this to us or to others for eternity. Jesus is not asking us to sell off everything so that we have to be homeless and going without. Though there are some people I have known to take vows of poverty. We call it downsizing. There's nothing wrong with being prepared for a future either. Even though any one of us may not have a lengthy mortal future. So what's the lesson here? The rich fool wasn't condemned because he had wealth. But he was called a fool because he was all about himself. He had lots. He wanted more so he could take it easy. Covetousness is a sin. And it's the root cause of many other sins. If we didn't want something that belonged to somebody else, we wouldn't lie, we wouldn't steal, we wouldn't murder all whole host of sins that come about from coveting something. If we look at covetousness in terms of an amount, instead of looking at covetousness as an attitude, we're making a big mistake. Poor people covet. Rich people covet. Men and women and children covet. The danger of coveting is not the amount. It's the attitude, the attitude of wanting more than what you actually need. 
if we are to live for God and, and our Savior, Jesus Christ, but our life is all about us and what we do for recognition or prestige or to make that one last dollar or to save that one last dollar. All these other things that people seek, all these things that we want people seeing us do, that's our reward. There's no reward in heaven for those good, nice acts of kindness. Are you possibly thinking that I'm saying that we need to do stuff for our salvation? No, not at all. We know that it's by grace that we are saved through faith in Jesus Christ. But the problem is that we take the grace and all that comes with salvation, and then much of the time we live as if, as if our life is our own. We have been bought for a price that we can't begin to pay for. We cannot work our way into heaven, but there is heaven waiting for us someday. We don't know the day or the hour, but it's coming to each of us. What will our master and savior say to us when we arrive? Have we arrived by that term, you know, just by the skin of our teeth? Maybe we just made it and that's all. Or will our master and savior tell us, well, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. That's from Matthew chapter 25. Each of us has a certain amount of time here on earth before our Lord and Savior will either come for us in the rapture or we're called home before. Have we sought out and invested in what the Lord has had in mind for us to do or have we built bigger barns for our earthly stay? Don't take that literally. You know where the, what I mean. I'm sure that we're not all building barns or digging wells for that matter. Again, I say, we're not our own any longer. We were all born in sin, and without faith in Jesus Christ, we would eventually die in our sin and be lost forever. But God chose each of us, thought each of us out, and showed us his commands. And God had used other people in the past in our lives to show us the ways of God through the teaching and living in the ways of the Lord. Then, you and I, we were still free to choose. We chose salvation, that salvation platter. And that comes to us from the sacrifice of God through Jesus Christ. And once we accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we in fact have said to God, whether we said it or not, I've, I've, I've never been my own boss. You created me, God. God didn't even have to do that, but he created us. And he's given us a choice. And we've said, we choose you, Lord. We choose, I choose to serve my Lord and my Redeemer. And once we've made that choice, we have signed our life over. We've re-signed it over. It wasn't ours to begin with, but God had given us freedom of choice. We've signed our life over to our creator and savior. Our life has always belonged to him. But now, as believers in Jesus Christ, we recognize and we've agreed that our life is no longer ours. Have we agreed that our life is no longer ours? I heard one yes. I wasn't looking for a bunch, but I mean, I wasn't looking for anything. But have we agreed that our life is no longer ours? It never has been. But seeing that we've done this, our life now no longer belonging to us, we need to be preparing for our eternal destination. It's during this journey that we travel for the rest of our lives that we have an opportunity to build up blessings and treasure in heaven. That's what we're going to be living with, living on. You can call that your heavenly retirement if you like. <coughs> Are we making eternal deposits or will our account just exist but really not have any balance in it? And you might ask, well, Mark, how do I prepare for eternal life? If I've asked Jesus for forgiveness of my sins and accepted him as Lord and Savior, what else do I need to do to prepare for this eternal life? 
we need to turn our lives over to Jesus Christ. Allow Jesus to have his way in our lives. Allow him to be daily, a daily part of our lives. And the more that we seek him, the more that we'll want to please him rather than ourselves. Really, it comes down to trust. Just like it was in the beginning. Adam and Eve only had to trust God and stay away from that tree. God is still asking us to trust in him. That he will look after us in our futures. Each and every one of us has been blessed richly by the Lord. From the beginning of time, from the foundations of the earth, through the ages, that salvation has come. Right down to our current heartbeat. Each and every moment has been a blessing from the Lord. We're not our own. We owe everything to the Lord. And the only way that that can happen is to submit to the Lord. Let him have control of our thoughts, of our actions. Not storing up for ourselves today, but sharing with others what we have. Be it our time, our wealth, our knowledge, our relationship that we've developed with God, sharing that with others. These are eternal treasures. And sharing these things and everything else that we have can bring others closer to God through Jesus Christ. And there is treasure in heaven that won't rot, that can't be stolen. We don't need to be fools. Let's just let Jesus have his way in our lives. Heavenly Father, Your word always doesn't sit well, especially when it talks about our wealth, whatever we consider to be wealth. Many people misquote your scripture when they say that, the, that money is the root of all evil, but Lord, we know that your word says it's the love of money that is the root of all evil. It's that hunger and thirst for more that has us working seven days a week. Not sparing the time for, for those who could use a little bit of our time, a little bit of our love. A little bit of our time to seek you in deeper ways and, and build on our relationship with you. I pray, Lord, that your message today speaks to each and every one of us because we are all guilty to a degree. Forgive us, Lord, and through your spirit, convict us to make changes in our lives as we move forward. We pray a blessing, Lord, on those missing from our fellowship this morning, and we just pray a blessing on them. We pray for healing for those who are in pain, for those who are in the hospital, those who are facing surgeries and treatments. We pray for those who are in long-term care those who could use a lifting of spirits, those who could live, uh, use a lifting of their hearts with a visit, a phone call. Help us to share, Lord, what you have given us because we, we are not our own. You tell us, Lord, that if we want to live, we must give up our lives, give them, giving them up to you. We pray, Lord, that you'll guide us, help us. We make this prayer in the name of Jesus who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Blessings on the day and the week that the Lord gives you. And of course, don't forget to wash your hands.